Dear Father, once again on this Sabbath day, we just ask for your presence. We pray that you can have our minds and our hearts open, that you can give me skill in presenting uh, this difficult study. I know, Lord, that we're going to have to spend time on our own studying these things, but we know, Lord, without your spirit, we cannot understand your truth. So we ask for a measure of your spirit, a double portion, as it were, and uh, we just pray that we can claim your promises of the former and the latter rain being poured out. We ask that the showers can sprinkle upon us and that uh, even though I have a prepared presentation, I pray, Lord, that you can bring to my mind things that uh, are new and old. And uh, we just uh, pray for, for each one here. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing here dealing with uh, the daily in history and prophecy. And this is my second lecture, but it's the third lecture. So, <clears throat> And we're going to deal with Daniel chapter 8. Now the verses that we're going to be studying, that hopefully by the end of this, we will understand them perfectly. But I don't expect that just because we go through it here in this short period of time that you're going to remember everything. Now we did have a handout by Robert Wieland uh, dealing with these things and it's the, the simplest or it's the most concentrated presentation I've seen on the daily. Um, so if you don't have those notes I suggest you get them and study them out on your own, on your knees, with your Bible and to see if these things are so. But the verses that we're going to be studying, Daniel chapter 8 verses 9 to 13, I'm just going to read through them first here and it says out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land and it waxed great even to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them yea he magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And he cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. And then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? So it's pretty, we all understand it, right? We can just go home now, right? Okay, there's a lot in here. And, uh, you know, these are the, the verses that mostly are dealt with when you're studying the daily. But we're going to be looking at, at quite a few more. But we are going to come back and look at this in detail. Now, first, we need to look at Daniel chapter 8. And at the beginning, it says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, that's in 538 BC. That's actually the year in which Belshazzar. Uh, his feast happened where Daniel read the writing on the wall figuratively and literally uh, that dealt with the fall of his kingdom so this is still though in the time of Babylon that this vision is given and he says a vision appeared unto me even unto me Daniel after that which appeared unto me at the first and I saw in a vision and it came to pass when I saw that I was in Shushan in the palace which is in the province of Elam and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher came up last, and I saw the ram pushing westward, and northward, and southward, so that no beasts might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will, and became great. Of course, there we see the ram, which we all know is Media Persia, right? So we don't need to go into those details. Now, it's, of course, coming from the east because it pr pushes westward, northward, and southward. And uh, one horn was higher than the other, right? Which is 
the first horn that uh, was the, the higher came up last. So the first horn was Media and the second horn was Persian. Right? Now as we go on in Daniel chapter 8 and we read, it's, we have now the, the goat. And it says, as I was considering, behold, an he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. That's Daniel 8, verse 5 to 8. Now, we're very familiar with this, and we're going to look at this in a little bit more detail. But one of the things that we always know, what is it about these animals? What do we note about these animals? What are these animals? They're, they're what? Okay, well, first off, they're sanctuary animals. Goats and rams are offered in the sanctuary. Okay? But, as Bonnie pointed out, they're flawed. So, first off, we have a ram with one horn bigger than the other. Would that be offered in the Jewish sanctuary? No, it wouldn't. How about a goat with one horn between its eyes? No, okay. Uh, and of course, the, the ram had its horns broken, so a broken horn would disqualify it. And then the goat, its horn broke, it broke, and then four horns grew up. You know, these are kind of deformed animals. They wouldn't be offered in the sanctuary. Now, as Adventists, we often make a note of this, that this is sanctuary symbolism. But we're going to see that it's counterfeit sanctuary symbolism. Um, another thing of note, and I may talk about it a bit later, but this happens in the time of Babylon. But it doesn't have a beast representing Babylon. Why is that? I, fi I finally found the answer. I, I've asked this question before. But the common answer is just, well, Babylon's, it's going to be on the way out right away, so it's just not important. But if you look at this prophecy, this prophecy is dealing with events that happen in the time of Media Persia, right? The 2300 days begins in the time of Persia, right? So we have. Um, uh, a prophecy that's not dealing with Babylon at all. Not because Babylon isn't, isn't going to be off the scene soon, but because the prophecy itself is dealing with events that happen after Babylon. That's a simple reason why. It's not going to have something dealing with Babylon when Babylon's not part of that picture, of the specific part that it's dealing with. It does deal with Babylon in one part of it, and we're going to see that later on when we deal with the two visions, because there's two visions in this prophecy. Now, this is from John W. Peters' Mystery of the Daily, and I've sent some of you an email with this, uh, but you can find it online. And uh, it's 117 pages, so I wasn't going to print it out and hand it out. Um, but it's it's a very well written uh, study on Daniel 9, uh, Daniel chapter 8, verses 9 to 14. But he said, this is in the, the part where he says, stating the problem. So he says, linguistically, so the words, uh, language-wise, some of the most apparently difficult passages in Scripture occur in Daniel 8, verse 9 to 14. Of course, these are the ones we're studying now. So uh, The text abounds with linguistic and contextual nuances. For example, the gender of the verbal subjects and the pronouns referring to the horn from littleness in verse 9 oscillates from masculine to feminine in verses 9 to 12. And, of course, when we get something mas uh, osculating, uh, osculating, <laughs> oscillating between masculine and feminine, what is that? What would we call that? Somebody who's sometimes a man, sometimes a woman. Trans yeah, so a transvestite or whatever. Um, obviously that's an abomination too, right? So we can see that that little horn which oscillates back and forth, not only is it, you know, 
a horn that grows up where it shouldn't grow from, but uh, it's also undecided as to its gender. So this is an important point. Okay, the next thing is does the daily refer to an earthly power or an activity? So we're going to look at that a little bit. He, he deals with it, some of these things in more detail than I do. Um, and then the third thing is what is the self-consistent relationship of the daily in Daniel 8 verse 11 and 13 with Daniel 11 31 and Daniel 12 11. So there's a lot of numbers there. Lots of 11's too. But uh, we're going to look at those. And what is the significance of Daniel's use of the verbal root room so that should be in italics because it's Hebrew, for the action imposed on the daily in 8 verse 11 in contrast with the Hebrew root sir in 1131 and 12 verse 11. You'll understand these things later on really well. You'll probably be dreaming about them at night. But uh, anyway, what is the significance of Daniel's use of two different Hebrew words, mikdash in 811 and 1131 and kodesh in Daniel 8, verse 13 and 14, translated as sanctuary. So there's words Mikdash and Kodesh, you know, you're not all Hebrew scholars. But Kodesh, I actually used to work for a guy named David Kodesh, right, or Kadash. And uh, that's, of course, his name meant holy, right, or the sanctuary, the holy place of the sanctuary. That was his last name. But uh, Mikdash is another word that we're going to look at. So we're going to look at all these words in detail. There's the use of makon for place in 811 instead of makom have textual significance. Is there a self-consistent application of the Hebrew particle shomem desolating in 813? I'm not going to look at that one. What is the significance of the Hebrew cultic language used in Daniel 8 verse 9 to 14? So that's what we're talking about, that these are sanctuary animals. There's a lot of sa sanctuary language being used. An examination of these questions, among other issues, will help to shed light on the interpretation of the daily, which in Hebrew is hatamid, in Daniel. Right. So this is the problem that we're going to tackle. So one of the things we want to look at as the our words here. Now he doesn't actually deal with this in his article, and I haven't seen many people deal with this. I've seen Jeff deal with this, but there's this word that's translated great, and it's the Hebrew word, the Strong's Numbers 1431. It's gadal, and it's a primitive root properly to twist, like making a rope uh, that is to be causatively make large in various senses as in body, mind, state, or honor. So it's something that's exalting itself. Boast, bring up, exceed, excellent, become, do, give, make, wax, great, right? To grow up, increase, lift up, magnify, to be much set by, nourished, past, promote, proudly spoken tower. This is a word that means to exalt oneself, right? And it's used in the scripture uh, often in exalting oneself in pride, such as Lucifer. So when we looked at these, we noticed that the ram became great, right? And that was in Hebrew, gadal. And the he goat waxed very great. That's uh, um, gadal ad meot, which means he great even exceedingly. So we have the ram was great, the he goat was very great, and then we have the little horn in Daniel 8 verse 9 and 11. And over, out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great. <coughs> and of course there's words attached to it as well, but I put Gadol. Towards the south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land, it waxed great even to the host of heaven. It cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified, that word is also g Gadal, himself even to the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So we see this goat there you, with the horn Rome. Uh, so we see that that little horn, it's exceeding great. Right? So we had great, we had very great, now we have exceeding great. So there's a progression. Um, there's also, as they become great, there's a greater corruption. Right? And we could see that in, in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream with the head of gold and the arms and uh, breast of 
of silver and so forth, there was a diminishing of the value of the metals, but there was an increase in the strength of the metal. So that's the human strength or the pride of self. And so we say to see the same progression in these powers as well. So we have the word gadol. Now we also have uh, some other words that are going to be used and we're going to look at each of them. Now this word rum uh, is a Hebrew word that's used um, in the sanctuary service. So when a priest would take some, cut off some meat off an offering and he'd lift it up, he would take away, so it could be translated take, take away, but it actually means to lift up and exalt. And uh, there's a whole bunch of different meanings and you know here it has hifal and stuff like this. These are different uh, uh, verbal forms of, of these words. But in this case it is in hifil form in, uh, in Daniel uh, chapter 8 and it means to rise up, rise up, be high, be lofty, be exalted to raise up, lift up, take up, set up. So we're going to see how this word apply, applies. Now there's another word which also can be translated as take away and this one does mean take away or remove, to dispose of something, to throw it away, to, you know, to abolish it, right? And this is the word sir. So I know we're going to learn a little bit of Hebrew. We've got room and sir. Uh, they both have a U in the middle, and they're both three letters that might help a little bit. But both of these words are translated as take away in the King James in relationship to the daily. But one means to lift up and exalt the daily. One means to remove the daily. So we need to have these words clear. Another word uh, is the words that are translated sanctuary and it talked about this mikdash and kodesh. Now mikdash is a cons consecrated thing or place especially a palace, a sanctuary whether of Jehovah or of idols, right? So mikdash could refer to any kind of sanctuary. It can refer to the earthly sanctuary. It never refers to the heavenly sanctuary. So mikdash does not refer to the sanctuary in heaven. There's some people who try to find a couple places where they apply it, but if you look at the context, it's referring to the earthly sanctuary. Um, Kodesh, on the other hand, uh, the holy place is called Kodesh. The most holy place is called Kodesh HaKodeshim, which is holy of holies, right? Um, so we say here, it's a sacred place or thing, rarely abstractly. So it's not used in an abstract sense very often. Uh, but it's holy, it also is translated holiness, holy, most holy, uh, in, in if it's doubled, right? And saint also, and sanctuary all come from this word Kodesh. But it's always referring to God's sanctuary, okay? And it can, of course, refer to the heavenly sanctuary, which Mikdash cannot. Okay. Now we have another word, and we're going to look at this in more detail. So we're just kind of skimming over these words. and. And you're going to have to go through and study these on your own to get them in your mind. But we have two words that are translated as the word vision in Daniel chapter 8 and other places in scripture. Uh, one is chazon. And this word uh, refers to a vision, a dream, a revelation, or an oracle. So it's not so much uh, an apparition. It doesn't have to be an apparition. Uh, it's often a sight mentally. Right? So it's a concept or an idea. And then we have one called Mara. And it's, it's also translated an appearance. Right? So it deals with something that we see. So usually a vision uh, that is seen by a prophet in some way. So there is uh, two different words that are translated vision. Now of course this is the big one. And so we have another word, the daily. Now, am I going too fast for people? I know this is like a lot to remember. You're not going to remember all these things right offhand. But we're going to go through them in the verses themselves. So, actually, tamid is the word daily. And um, I got a really interesting Hebrew lexicon uh, recently online. And Hebrew is written in pictographic language that is just like... Uh, Chinese is or um, uh, Egyptian. Now we don't think of it that way because of course these words come to mean things but originally it was a pictographic language. 
and uh, they use the, the sounds of these words to give them the sounds of their letters, but all their letters are drawings of things. And uh, it's very, very interesting going through finding out, you know, all these roots. And I, I could have spent a lot of time going through this lexicon and explaining these things. But when we deal with some something like tamid, it's actually uh, tamid, which is the word daily, comes from the word mot, which is to stretch out, right? So the idea is not an event, right? Something you do every day, but it's something that's stretched out over a long period of time. So it's important to understand. That's why it's translated as continual. But it's not in the continuum that you know you do it every day. It's it's something that's drawn out, stretched out, okay. And um, so when we're dealing with this daily in Daniel, uh, people have said, well, because it is translated as the word daily. So when you have the perpetual burnt offering or the daily burnt offering, those. Um, you know, they would have a perpetual fire. There's a, a fire that's burning in the altar continually, right? If they don't start it and stop it, start it and stop it. So the way that it was understood in the Jewish sanctuary, the idea of daily, is that it was a continuance, right? It was a continual thing. Um, so this word is used in connection with God's sanctuary. But as we see here in Daniel chapter 8, we see that there's a counterfeit sanctuary that's being dealt with, right? With deformed animals, uh, using some of the words that are, that apply to the earthly sanctuary sacrifice, but applying them to these pagan powers. So when we deal with this daily here, it's the daily that's counter, counteracting Christ's daily, or God's daily, which was the daily ministry of the earthly sanctuary. What counterfeited or contradicted Christ's daily ministry or of the earthly sanctuary. That was paganism, right? So we can see here the daily here is a counterfeit worship. So to try to apply it to Christ's heavenly ministry, as Prescott did um, and others, we, we lose the whole sense of what Daniel 8 is talking about. So you'll see as we go through this, it's really important. Now another one which I've discussed on, on the internet with people is this word mekon. And again, the same idea applies. If you look up this word, mekon, mekon actually, um, and uh, you look at it in the Bible, every time it's referring to the foundation of God's throne or God's sanctuary, right? So it's not dealing with paganism at all. Except here, in Daniel chapter 8, because of the counterfeit nature of this worship, this word that is normally used for God's throne is now being used for Satan's throne. Right? So we're going to see how these things, how these things happen. As you go through the verses, you, it'll make more sense. Okay, is that clear? Enough? Okay, the next thing that we're going to deal with is this vendor, uh, gender verb. Uh, alternation. So in verse 9, you'll see that he came. And that's uh, referring to paganism. It became great. That's referring to papalism. And you'll see that we have this, whenever it refers in the masculine in Hebrew, it's talking about paganism and the act of this little horn, the pagan part, pagan Rome. And whenever it's feminine, it's talking about, and it'll be translated as it, right? But it's talking about the work of the papacy, okay? So we're going to see that. So now here we go. Here we have Daniel 8, verse 9 to 13. So all these words that we just discussed, we're going to go through them slowly here, hopefully. And I put them in orange to contrast the blue. Out of one of them, the four winds. So this is, we just talked about this, these the goat with the horns being broken and they were their kingdoms went to the four winds of heaven and it says out of one of them that is out of one of the four winds not out of one of the horns one of the ways we know that is that winds is feminine and uh, the words here are in the feminine form so we know that it's coming out of the feminine winds so it has to be 
uh, that is coming out of, not out of the horns, because the horns are masculine, right? Came forth a little horn. Now, when we look at this, you will find that uh, all the pioneers agree that, and even both views will say that this little horn is both pagan and papal Rome, right? So I haven't been able to find anybody who says it's just papal Rome. Everybody says that it's both pagan and papal, but there might be some people who just try to get rid of the paganism altogether. But they will say, that, oh yes, you know, this little horn came out and it's pagan and papal Rome in both its phases. Now, in the view that I was taught, you know, in Adventism and, you know, reading the stuff from the BRI, is that um, they look at this contrast between earthly and heavenly. So there's stuff on earth, the stuff on heaven, and that's the way they try to deal with this. Where Miller understood this as a contrast between paganism and papalism. So even though they all recognize the feminine and the two phases, they interpret it differently. And different people do it differently, so there isn't like one standard way. Uh, I've run into lots of differences. So I'm going to try to deal with what I would consider the most common view when I deal with their view. Okay, so we have Rome in both its phases, pagan and papal, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. So this is Rome, pagan Rome, the way it conquered, right? So if it goes from the, goes toward the south, and toward the east, and toward the pleasant land, what direction is it coming from? Because we got, it's coming from the north, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is Rome. This is the way that Rome conquered. And uh, of course, when you read about how Rome conquered, it was different than a lot of the other nations. Uh, they conquered, you know, through flatteries, right? They, uh, people wanted to join Rome, you know. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't mind becoming part of the Roman Empire. Okay, so now when we get into this here and it says, and it wax great, we find that this it, it then is papal Rome, right? It waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it, papal Rome, cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. So it's talking about this power, papal Rome. So what does it mean that papal Rome waxed great even to the host of heaven? What's the host of heaven? Okay, God's people. Now, did Papal Rome go into heaven? Right. So it can't be talking about the actual heaven where the angels angels dwell. Um, now, also, when we look at what is paganism, what did paganism worship? They worship the stars, right? They worship, you know, astrology and all those types of things, the gods in the heavens. So one of the things that Papal Rome does when it waxes, it waxes towards uh, even to the host of heaven. So this can apply to either God's people, but it also can apply to the pagan gods. Did this happen with papalism? Did papalism, what I did in the first lecture, did it use the papal, uh, the pagan gods, the idols, and worship them? Yes, it did. So that's one of the things that caused it to wax great, okay? Um, and it cast down some of the stars and of the host to the ground and stamped upon them. Now, if we look at this then as dealing with, there's two different ways we can look at this. Some of this look at Christianity and the persecution that happens. But we can also see that there is uh, wars that happen between paganism and papalism, right? So there's battles that happen in the transition. So you could look at it either way. I'm not 100% decided which way to interpret that. Uh, but I do take it as uh, that this is the power of papal Rome that's being talked about here. Now it says, yea, he, pagan Rome, magnified himself to, and that word is against, the prince of the host. So did pagan Rome uh, magnify itself or exalt itself against Christ? It did, literally against Christ, because they crucified him, right? Now, some who take the new view uh, 
might include that this applies to both, right? So they'll kind of say, well, it applied to, you know, pagan Rome, but, you know, it's really talking about uh, papal Rome, right? And we're going to see that as we deal with it. But this is the, what we do know is that pagan Rome did come and magnify itself against Christ, the Prince of the Host. And in this word, and by him, we're all agreed that that word by should be translated from. And so from him, so the him then is pagan Rome, right? Because it's masculine. The daily was taken away. Now, we have this word daily, and I guess I could have put hatamid in there, but we know what that is. The word sacrifice is added by man's wisdom. It does not belong to the text, Ellen White says in page 74 of early writings. Right? So we know that this word sacrifice, I crossed it out. It's also in italics because it's an ad word, but I crossed it out. And, um, and that word taken away in the King James is actually the word room, right? So that word means to lift up and exalt. And I put here, lifted up as a wave offering or heave offering, right, in the sanctuary. So what we see that Rome is doing I hope everyone's following me, is that Rome is doing a counterfeit worship. It's taking the sacrifice of the paganism, right? Paganism is being taken out of the way, right? But it's exalting it and lifting it up. So there's a change from paganism to papalism. Now when papalism is exalting, lifting up this offering, what is that offering? It's paganism, right? But now it has a different form. So we can see that the, it's important to understand this transition from pagan to papal in order to understand what Daniel 8 is talking about. I'm going to look at the new view and how they interpret these verses and you can see it's not going to make sense. It's not going to follow from what these words mean. Okay, so it's really important that we understand that here in Daniel chapter 8 where it says the daily was taken away, this is not talking about the daily being taken away. Okay? Shouldn't be translated take away. Now there is two other places, uh, Daniel 11.31 and Daniel 12.11, where it is a different word, and it should be, and it talks about the daily being taken away, but we're going to look at that in detail. Okay? So now we see this work. What we see then, you know, in the picture as I picture it, as I see this sanctuary service where a transition is mean, being made from paganism to papalism. That's why this sanctuary language. And we have one counterfeit being exchanged for another counterfeit. Okay? And that other counterfeit is basically the first one, but it's changed. Right? So papalism is paganism, but it's in the church. Okay? So Rome uh, lifts up and exalts the daily, it exalts paganism, right, as an offering. And it says, and the place or the foundation, that's the word mekom, of his, that's paganism sanctuary, and that word sanctuary there is mikdash, was cast down. So does anybody have any questions about this? So what we see is when papalism comes and it conquers paganism, it's still paganism. But the place of paganism is cast down. Right? So it's not following, it's not offering, it's not doing temple sacrifices of, of animals anymore. So it sort of discards certain aspects of paganism. But it's still paganism. It's just in a new form. Does everybody see that that's what this is saying? Does it make sense? I don't know if anybody has questions about it. Okay. Okay, now the next part. So we see that, uh, you know, paganism has changed into papalism. And one of the things that happens is a host was given him. So what's a host? What's that? People, right? People. And usually an army, right? So. When did papalism get an army? Yeah. 
Well, between 508 and 538, Clovis and 508, right? They, they have now had an army, right? And that's, of course, dealing with when it says, and it cast down some of the host the, of the stars to the ground. We can see that that's paganism's host, but papalism also gets a host or an army. So these two armies fight against each other. Okay, so there's a transition between these two armies. And uh, uh, when papal, papal Rome gets the armies, it then uproots uh, these horns, right? So these horns are uprooted as well. So we're not going to go into the detail of that prophecy at this point. So a host was given him against the daily. So a host was given Papal Rome to fight against who? Paganism. Paganism. Does, now we, does um, Rome get an army to fight against Christ's heavenly ministry? You know? Sure, the papacy persecutes God's people, but it doesn't have an army to fight against Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. It can't even get into heaven, right? So to talk about Christ's heavenly sanctuary being the daily, um, papalism has an army, but it doesn't have an army to fight against Christ. It does fight against Christ's people, it persecutes them, but first it fights against the daily, which is paganism. And it says, by reason of transgression. So this I could have looked at in more detail. But this transgression is uh, the transgression of desolation. It has to do with the way that uh, uh, it's actually in transgression. So there is a way in which uh, that papalism fought against paganism. Right? So there was armies involved, but there was also a change in doctrine. Right? So a new doctrine also undid paganism. So the only way that papalism could have come into power is if it held on to certain aspects of paganism to make it attractive to the people. And that's what we saw in Ellen White's uh, Great Controversy Chapter 3, is that the transgression, the sins, the false doctrine of papalism allowed it to replace paganism. Without the false doctrines it, that were taken from paganism, it, couldn't, it wouldn't have been attractive to the worldly mind. It had to have worldliness mixed in with it in order to be attractive to the world, right? And it, Papal Rome, cast down the truth to the ground. So this is what we saw in Great Controversy as well. Did Papalism cast down the truth to the ground? Yes, it did, in all their false doctrines, right? And it, Papal Rome, practiced and prospered. And this is just a continuation of this idea. So this has to do with uh, the, its teachings, which grew in, into uh, all those complex things. So Ellen White is basically summing up, you know, if we just went through the Great Controversy, all these things that we're talking about, this is what Ellen White is basically talking about in Great Controversy Chapter 3. An, an era, era of darkness, right? And um, the next thing is, then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision? Now here we have the word chazon, right? Concerning the daily sacrifice, or the daily, which is paganism. So there's a vision, and we're going to look at this in more detail, but it has to deal with paganism. And the transgression of desolation, papalism. To give both the sanctuary, and that's Kodesh, so God's sanctuary, and the host to be trodden underfoot. So, one of the things that we are going to see here is that this vision that's talked about, does it include just papalism? This chazon, chazon, chazon. It deals with paganism, right? The daily, and papalism. Now, if you were going to translate this another way, well, let's look at that. So now we're going to look at the new view. So here I have the same verses. Just switch some of the words around. So I don't want you to get confused. So now we've just gone through one and now we've got another one which is similar. But you're going to see the contrasts. And uh, 
It says, out of one of them, the four winds came forth a little horn, Rome, both pagan and papal. So this starts with the same. Which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great. Papal Rome. Right? So we, did, we said the same thing, right? Even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Yea, he... So now they say this he is papal Rome. Now some will say both pagan and papal Rome magnified himself to or against the prince of the host, against Christ. But then they're having two different applications. They're saying pagan Rome came against Christ literally, papal Rome came against heaven. So they have the earthly and the heavenly is their contrast. That's what they're trying to focus upon. There's an earthly part of the, of the ministry and a heavenly part of the ministry. And that's what I used to believe. Uh, actually, when I was uh, a student here at Concordia back in 19, would have been 94, 93, I wrote a paper on the book of Daniel, and I dealt with the new view, of course, that's what I understood. But it got really confusing. I mean, obviously, got past my professor because he thought the paper was great. But, uh, um, I was never really happy with my understanding of the daily being Christ's ministry at that time. I mean, I accepted it as true, but there were things that I couldn't make fit, no matter how hard I tried. So I always felt like I was, there was something missing, there was something wrong, and I just didn't know what it was. But, uh, you know, and I was going through looking at all the, the Hebrew words and trying to match them up and make sense out of it. But, uh, I think at that time I'd actually taken the position that was both pagan and papal Rome that magnified himself against the prince of, prince of the host. But here's where the problem came. And from him, that is from him, they put Christ. Okay? And that's what I put. That's what I would think. Him is now referring to Christ. Now where does, now we can see it's talking about the prince of the host here. In English, we commonly, you know, would look at it, okay, it's the Prince of Hosts, and now from him, that would naturally be, but in Hebrew, it's not like that. Language doesn't work that way. So you can't just look at it in English and think, okay, now him is going to refer to the previous him, right? Um, but if we had it as him, this is what they have, and from him, Christ, the daily was taken away. Now what they have to do here is they can't say from him, Christ, the daily Christ sacrifice or Christ ministry was lifted up and exalted, right, as a wave offering. Right, they can't do that. They have to ignore the meaning of room. Okay? So they just cross that out. Does that make sense? So they're ignoring what that word means and just saying that, oh, it's taken away. Mm -hmm. Even though the word doesn't mean take away. And they try to make, and in the Biblical Research Institute, you know, they have articles and trying to say, well, it means take away because the priest takes away the meat from, but it's actually lifting up and exalting something. It's not discarding something, right? It's not removing something and casting it into the garbage. It's lifting up something, removing in a sense of lifting, right? Okay, and the place, foundation of Christ's sanctuary was cast down. So, did the papacy, okay, what is the foundation of Christ's sanctuary? You know, we have, we have two, we could look at the foundation is the place for, of where he establishes his sanctuary on earth and the place where he establishes his sanctuary in heaven. Now, it is true that the Catholic Church has counterfeited these things, but can we say that it took the foundation of Christ's sanctuary and cast it down? You know, removed it utterly and entirely? No. And of course the word mikdash here, they're taking as it's never used in reference to the heavenly sanctuary. So this would have to refer to the earthly sanctuary, which of course the Catholic Church had nothing to do with. Right? They weren't on the scene at that time. And then it says, And a host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. And then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily? Christ's heavenly ministry is the way they look at it. So it's the daily sacrifice, even though it's in italics, which I didn't put it there, but they look at it, it needs to be there. 
and the transgression of desolation, papalism, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So now here we have, again, this word Kodesh, where here we had Mikdash. So Daniel could use, you know, Kodesh in both places if he meant Kodesh in both places. But to use Mikdash in one place and Kodesh in another shows that there's a difference between these two sanctuaries. One's a pagan sanctuary, one's God's sanctuary. Okay? So I hope I didn't confuse you using uh, going through their view, but we're going to look at it a little bit more in detail. So Miller's view was, Pagan Rome magnified himself against Christ, the Prince of Princes at the crucifixion. <coughs> Papal Rome lifts up and exalts the daily, that is paganism in Christian garb. Right? Papal Rome casts down the foundation of paganism sanctuary, the Pantheon in Rome. The question of how long includes both the remaining time of pagan Rome, and actually all of paganism, and the 1260 years of Papal Rome. That is, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily paganism and the transgression of desolation, papalism, to give both the earthly and heavenly sanctuary, that is Kodesh, and the host, God's people, to be trodden underfoot. Right? And we're going to see this. So this is Miller's view. So this makes sense to me now. Didn't until I studied it. Now the new view, and there are variations of this, but in the new view, Papal Rome magnified himself against Christ, the Prince of Princes, in the sacrifice of the Mass. Papal Rome takes away the daily sacrifice, right, Christ's heavenly ministry, but they ignore the meaning of room. Papal Rome casts down the foundation of Christ's heavenly sanctuary. But the question is how and when? When did they do that? Because as we saw in the Great Controversy, Ellen White shows that there's this gradual progression of false doctrine. At what point do we say, well now we have the man of sin being revealed? If it's just obscuring Christ's ministry, it did long before the sixth century, right? And the question of how long becomes enigmatic. It's an enigma. That is, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily ministry of Christ? That's the question now in their way that they look at it. And the transgression of desolation, papalism, to bo give both the heavenly sanctuary and the host, God's people, to be trodden underfoot. It cannot begin before at least 34 AD. I mean, obviously, until Christ has a heavenly ministry, we can't have it being taken away. So the question of how long is a problem. Now, so we deal with the 2300 days, right? And he said unto me, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Right? So that's the answer that's given. How long? The Bible says, unto 2300 days. So is the 2300 days an end point Right? Or a duration? Is it just in 2,300 days then the sanctuary will be cleansed? Or is there a length, a duration? Is there things happening during that period? Right? Well, one of the things we know that's happening is the trotting down. There's all these, these things that are occurring. Um, if it's not 2,300 years of actual duration, why would you ask how long? You would say, when? When is this going to happen? But it's already how long? And the question how long is asked in the Bible always in dealing with the treading down of God's people, right? So it's the same question that's how long in the book of Revelation. Okay, so the question is when does it start then, right? If it is a duration, and when does it end? Does it include the earthly and heavenly sanctuaries? Does it include pagan and papal Rome? We need to understand these things. So what I want to look at here now is the other places where it talks about the word daily or the daily. And those are in Daniel 11 verse 31 and Daniel 12 verse 11. Daniel 11 31 says, And the arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away, that is the word sir, which means remove, the daily. So this isn't the word 
room, which means to lift up and exalt, right? This is talking about a battle or a war in where uh, the sanctuary of strength is going to be pol polluted, which is, of course, uh, paganism's armies. And uh, they shall take away the daily, and they, and they shall place, and uh, that word place is Nathan, or Nathan, and it means to give, just like Jonathan, which means Jehovah gives, right? So if you want to remember that one. So, so the thing that happens here is we have the daily is removed and something is given. What's given? The abomination that makes desolate. Okay? So you see that here is the exchange. Now in the other place in Daniel chapter 8, the reason why it uses the word room, lift up and exalt, is because it's giving an illustration of a counterfeit sanctuary worship, right? So it's using sanctuary language there to describe everything, but it's counterfeit. Here now, in Daniel 11, we're not using a sanctuary symbolism at all. Okay, my daughter has nine fingers. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to take a little bit longer, that's all. Because <laughs> I have more to do. So anyway, um, we see the abomination that maketh desolate is given in place of what was removed. Okay, so there's this exchange. This exchange is extremely important. If we're going to say that this daily is Christ's ministry that's removed, and then that they're given this abomination that maketh desolate, we're going to run into some problems. Let's look at Daniel 12, verse 11, and it says, From the time that the daily shall be taken away. So when, when is this period, the, when is the daily taken away? Okay, 508, right? It's removed. And the abomination that maketh settle up, maketh des desolate set up, Natan to give, there shall be 1,290 days. So we see that there's a very specific point in history in which we know, as Seventh-day Adventists, that the daily was taken away in 508. If we're going to apply this to Christ's ministry, do we have any basis to say that something happened in 508 in regards to Christ's ministry? Nothing. One of the criticisms that Adventism has by the Protestant world is how do we justify 508 and 538, the 1260 years, the 1290, the 1335. They say we have no basis whatsoever because nothing happens any different in 508 as far as false worship, right? All that happens is political things. And the political thing that happens is the military power being given over to the papacy. And then 30 years of preparation until the papacy is finally has its power, seat, and great authority, right? So it gets all those three things. Um, also uproots three obstacles as well. So uh, three of the, the, the ten kingdoms. Okay, is this making sense? I hope it is. Because I understand it perfectly now, I think. Okay, well let's look at, well we had looked at this in the first one, the setting up the abomination of desolation. So we had the daily taken away in 508, and then there's that 30 year period of preparation uh, of political battles until finally the Catholic Church sits upon, the Pope sits upon the throne of the earth, and now they have the power to persecute true worshipers of God. Right? They have all the political power they need. So we can see that there's a specific point in history. Now, if we're going to take the 2300 evenings and mornings, why would we start with 457 BC? If we're looking at this as the taking away of the daily, you know, we get rid of this. Okay? So in Daniel chapter 8, if the question of how long would be answered unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So the daily is going to be taken away before the 2300 days begins, right? So then we would have to have some daily, to have 2300 days end in 1844, well we couldn't start with 457 BC, right? We'd have to start with some other date. Adventism falls apart, right? The abomination being set up, whether it's set up then or, you know, who knows? There's nothing where we can talk about the abomination of desolation being set up in relation to taking away of the daily, right? So. 
we have these 2300 years, when does it end? When does the 1290 end? When does the 1335 years end? We have no basis to talk about any of these dates. One of the things that Miller did in understanding paganism and papalism is that he understood that the 2300 years were dealing with the past, you know, be before the time of Christ and time afterwards, right? When he connected the 70 weeks to the 2300 days, it was because of his understanding of paganism and papalism. One of the things I, I find funny is, um, in discussing this with people, is often, you know, they're Seventh-day Adventists and they believe certain things because we're Seventh-day Adventists. You know, some of them were brought up Seventh-day Adventists. And they will believe things like, they will tell me, uh, you know, 457 BC, that's the date for, you know, the Arctic Xerxes decree. Most of the Christian world accepts 458 BC, right? 34 AD for the stoning of Stephen. Well, there is no historical evidence for when Stephen stoned, when the end of the 70 weeks happened. There's no, most Christians don't have Christ's uh, baptism happening in 27 AD. They don't have his crucifixion happening in 31 AD, right? Most of our dates are not accepted dates, right? That's a fact. So if we're going to believe what we believe as Seventh-day Adventists, we have to have a basis that ties all these dates together. And, um, you know, we need the 2300 days. We need the 1260. We need the 1290. We need the 1335. We need all of these, these dates. So I think part of the problem is in Daniel chapter 8 and also in other places in Daniel is that we have two different visions that are being talked about. It says here, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision? Now that word there, chazon, concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation. So this is dealing with two phases, the daily sacrifice, or the daily, and the transgression of desolation. So that's paganism and papalism, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. That's the question, right? And... Um, in Daniel 8, verse 15 and 17, it says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision, that's the Chazon, and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me the appearance, that's a Mera, of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the Mara. Okay? So he had seen the vision, that's the one dealing with paganism and papalism. But now, he has another vision that deals with something. Uh, make this man to understand the vision, Mara. So he came near where I stood, and when he came I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. So he wants to make him understand the Mara, but he says, At the time of the end shall be the vision. So this vision, this Chazon, is dealing with something that's it's a longer period, it's a bigger period, it's, it's uh, more encompassing than the Mara. And the vision Mara of the evening and the morning which was told is true. So we can see here this word Mara, this vision, is the evening and morning vision. The vision dealing specifically with the sanctuary. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, Chazon, for it shall be for many days. Right, so we have the same thing being said. This is in chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days, and afterward I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision. That's the 2300 days. And astonished means he was not able to understand it, right? He was shocked at this vision, but none understood it. Okay? So I know this is, we're probably getting a little tired. I'm getting tired. Anyway, so in 9, verse 21, we know that Daniel seeks to understand the 70-year prophecy that is coming to an end. And he says, While I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, who I had seen in the vision, that's the Chazon, at the beginning, being caused, caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. So this is in the vision of Daniel chapter 8, which is dealing with paganism and papalism, right? 
At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I am come to show them, show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter, and consider the vision. This time he wants him to consider the 2300 days. Okay? And then he says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, right, and so forth. Now, one of the things that this vision does, the 70 weeks, is it seals up vision and prophecy. So it seals up the vision, which is Kazon. Okay? So I know this is getting a little bit confusing for people. It's something you're going to have to study out. But the one thing is, as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that when he says he wanted to understand the matter, consider the vision, we know that that's referring to the 2300 days. I've known this for 25 years, right? So this is nothing new, this uh, Chazon and Mara. The thing that I didn't understand before is that this Chazon is dealing with both paganism and papalism. This 2300 days is just dealing with the sanctuary. Does that make sense? So there are two different visions that are being talked about. Now we also see this in Daniel chapter 10. Uh, the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, so this is a few years later, um, that Daniel has this vision and he says, but the, uh, the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and he had an understanding of the vision. Which vision did Daniel understand here? The 2300 days, the Mara, right? Right? So we now know that in Daniel chapter 10, he understood the 2300 day prophecy. But he didn't earlier. Daniel chapter 9, he didn't. The angel had to make him understand it. Now he understood it. He always understood the Chazon, right? That it was uh, a different vision, right? From the Mara, right? Because he used two different words. And in those times, there's, now this is Daniel 11, 14. It talks about them, uh, the vision again, the Chazon. And in those times shall there many stand up against the king of the south also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision who's the robbers of thy people the papacy this is rome of course no this isn't the papacy is not the robbers of this is pagan rome okay pagan rome is the robbers so rome is the robbers of thy people right and it they when they exalt themselves it helps establish the chazon chazon right but they shall fall. So what happened is Rome came into the scene at first, but they didn't develop yet because what power had to, to grow and develop? Greece, right? Okay. But Rome came onto the scene to establish the vision. So it says that Rome is important in establishing the vision of paganism and papalism. Okay. Um, now if we look at Habakkuk chapter 2, we see that it also talks about a vision that needs to be written and made plain upon tables. Right? I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what they, he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved or argued with. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables. So, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome. Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome. What, what, what vision is this? Paganism, papalism, right? It's the Kazon vision, Chazon vision, okay? Chazon, right? So that's what we have, is we have this vision is the 2520, right? It's the complete vision. The whole kit and caboodle, all the seven times, right? It's not a part of it, it's not the Mara, the 2300 days, though the 2300 days is on here, right? But, and we, as Adventists, we always just think about the 2300 days. But the fact is, this, both of these start in 677 BC, right? And they go up till 1843, and this one until 1844. But that's the vision that was written, right? For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. Now, of course, the 2300 days is included in the 2520, right? It's part of it. And when you look at all these prophecies, they all tie together. Now, um, is everybody really tired now? No? Okay. I know my time is up, but I'm just going to explain something here. So when we look at all these visions, and I, I probably could have 
had a chart of it because I did have in my first lectures uh, of the whole prophecy. Um, here, I'm just going to do this. Could have just copied it and pasted it into that file, but uh, oh, forget that. Here we'll just. You're just going to have to visualize it. You're going to have to use your imagination. But if we take the 2300 days, is the 2300 days tied to any other prophecy? No. Well, just, you know, a seventh day, standard seventh day. It is tied to the 70 weeks, right? So we do have the 2300 days and the 70 weeks tied together. Now, is the 1260 year prophecy tied to the 2300 days in any way? Any endpoints? No, it's not. Now, the 1290 and the 1335 are 12 tied to the 1260. Um, but these prophecies, we, that's why as Seventh-day Adventists we could get rid of the 1290, the 1335, you know, the 1260 is pretty much out the window now too. We got rid of Josiah Litch's uh, uh, understanding of, uh, of uh, Revelation 9 verse 15 dealing with the hour, day, a month, and a year, right? Uh, and we could still hold on to the 2300 days, right? We could still hold on to it. But it's not a very solid foundation by itself. Now, the 2300 days and the sanctuary is the foundation and central pillar of Adventism, right? Without, those, without that foundation, without that pillar. Now, it's a foundation because prophecy is foundational. Pillars are doctrines, right? So it's the doctrine of the sanctuary of Christ, our ministry in the high... That's the doctrine part of it. That's the pillar part of it. The prophecy part of it is the foundation. And so when I discuss this with people, they say, well, you're against the 2300 days because you're saying it's so weak it can't stand on its own. But the thing is, it's part of this whole prophetic puzzle, right? If we keep removing the other things that support the 2300 days, what's going to happen to the 2300 days? It's going to crumble. Right? It's going to fall. And that's what it's doing before our enemies. It's being attacked. Well, I shouldn't even say before our enemies. Within Seventh-day Adventism, there is a belief, a large portion of Adventism, who doesn't care one whit about the 2300 days. They don't care about October 22nd, 1844. You know, there's a bunch of people who still hold on to it tenaciously, right? Because they want to be Adventists and they think they have to hold on to it. But there will come a time when they will see that they can still be Adventists and not believe the 2300 days. Why would they hold on to it? Right? Because they don't believe it, really. They don't understand it. They don't know it. They don't know all the implications of what it means. They don't believe in the things that it represents. You know, the cleansing of the sanctuary. They don't believe in overcoming sin. They don't believe in all kinds of things that are connected with the cleansing of the sanctuary, preparing of God's people. So just like they have let go of other prophecies, they will also let go of that. They will still try to hold on to it. We still believe in Christ as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. You know, he's our high priest and we need to bring this truth to other people. But 1844, no, we don't care for, right? And that's what's happening within Adventism. And if you don't believe it's happening, all you have to do is go onto Facebook and start talking with people. Uh, start reading, you know, the stuff that's being written in Adventist periodicals and you'll see that that is happening within Adventism. So the question is, I mean, we might just say, well that's what we believe. Adventism is should just be one of the other churches and we were kind of mistaken. You know, Miller was all wrong about things and uh, you know, there's no need to really believe, you know, we have the Sabbath and we have, you know, Christ's high priestly ministry and, and we can preach a gospel that's about the people you know, we can do the doctrine of Christ thing that Prescott was doing, but ignoring the warnings that are in God's word and actually making something that sounds good on the surface. We're talking about Christ, the doctrine of Christ. I mean, he calls it the doctrine of Christ. Well, everybody wants to talk about Jesus, right? But rejecting the foundation upon which we establish who Christ is. Now, understanding who the papacy is, you know, I've read it so many places in re recent years, in quarterlies, um, in Adventist periodicals, that it's not important. We're focusing too much upon the papacy, because that's not our big 
issue, right? I even used to say that type of thing, you know. Sorry, but I did. You know? But now I understand the importance of it. Because we're going to do the same thing that happened to the early Christian church. We're going to have, we're going to end up worshiping a false Christ. And so we have to know these things for ourselves. So, uh, you know, Brent is going to, we're going to take a little bit longer break here. And Brent's going to hit you with a bunch of stuff. And then after his, his talk, we're going to, we're going to maybe have a question and answer, uh, whatever anybody wants to ask questions about. Um, but, uh, you know, my appeal to you is to study these things out for yourselves. Um, you know, I know sometimes it seems a little bit difficult. I mean, this, this, was, this was a difficult study. There's so much I was telling you and it just went in one ear and out the other, I, I imagine, because... Uh, Yes, you have a question. Yep. Yep. Okay, is there a concerted effort within Adventism to undermine the basic pillar of Adventism? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, one of them, which is the sanctuary. Um, well, the short answer is yes, but the long answer is that in doing that, people don't believe they're doing something wrong. They believe that they're seeing light, right? They believe this is an advancement of, it comes down to there's two different beliefs about why we believe what we believe. One is the development theory, is that God throughout ages is understood by man because we're subjective creatures and we can't know God and so God can only reveal himself a little bit at a time and we have lots of errors of the past that were just errors right and God used all these errors to develop in us this understanding this enlightenment that we now have it's basically evolution the evolution of religion so, you know, so people used to, you know, worship stones and sticks and then, you know, and, and you see this all through religious uh, um, studies. That's the approach that's used. It's, it's a worldly approach to studying religion. And that has infiltrated our understanding and study of Adventism. So that when you read people like George R. Knight's books on Adventism, he's presenting an evolutionary view of Adventism. We were wrong about these things, but now we know better. Older is always worse, newer is always better, right? So if it's new, it's got to be good, right? Because we're developing, we're growing, we're evolving, right? That is the view. It's an honestly held view. And for many of them, they've been taught it in so many ways in their whole life, they don't even know that it's there. The other view is that God unfolds his revelation to mankind. Mankind often, you know, may not understand it completely, but what is truth that was unveiled in the past doesn't become error as time goes on. It's still truth. So, you know, what the Jews believed was truth. You know, sure, they may not have understood all the truth that was revealed to them, but they weren't believing error, right? What is revealed in God's word is truth. What was revealed to disciples is truth. What was revealed, you know, as we go on and on through Adventism, what established Adventism at the beginning was truth. This was a foundation of our faith, these the, mes the truths on these charts, but it's honestly held by some people that these these charts contain errors, lots of errors, right? So much error that there's not much truth left on them at all, and it's a, in their view, error led us to these wonderful truths that we believe as Adventists, which to me is nonsense. You know, it's, I mean, I see it quite clearly as nonsense. You know, God revealed to us truths bit by bit, but they were all truths. We don't have to abandon what was taught in the past. We have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the way that the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Ellen White's very clear that she established what was established in 1840, 1842, 1843, 1844 is to be as the rock of ages. To her it was the rock of ages. Yeah, the old paths. Yeah, uh, the foundations of many generations in in uh, 
Isaiah 56, 14, whatever it is, 57, 58, 13, 14. Yes, thank you. Um, it's a scripture song, that's why I know it. Um, but I just don't know the verses. Uh, but anyway, you can see that that's what's happening. Is it a concerted effort? Do people, you know, know what they're doing? No. No, they, they sincerely believe what they're doing. When you have pastors who, you know, don't want to talk about prophecy, you know, they believe that prophecy detracts us from knowing about Christ. It's all speculation. It's all fanaticism, you know. Uh, but the reality is most of the Bible is prophecy. Jesus gave us a revelation of Jesus Christ, which is prophecy. And yet this is what, you know, often they may present, use prophecy to get people into the church and certain doctrines, but then you never hear it from it again. So people become Adventists, you know, an evangelistic series that's based on prophecy. That's why they're trying to get away from the prophecy evangelistic series, because we don't teach it in church. Why should we teach somebody to bring them in to become an Adventist when that's not what we actually hear from the pulpit? Right? So all the evangelistic series now are using other approaches, you know, self-help type, types of ideas. Nothing wrong with having uh, a series on, you know, health, right? Because it's the right arm. But if that's all they ever hear is the health message, are they going to be in God's kingdom? They need to know, are they going to be able to go through the time ahead? The health message is important. But we need to know prophecy because it's the foundation. So, I mean, that's the long answer. The short answer is shorter <laughs> yeah and there's probably a lot more I mean I I'm not an expert on all these things I don't spend a lot of time uh, studying what uh, the errors in Adventism I'm just not really that interested in it. I'm not interested in who's doing what and and criticisms of the church because uh, that's not what this is about it's not finding fault with the church it's studying studying the truth right we need to know what the truth is and yeah, groups that are going around, you know, calling the church Babylon or looking at the faults and the flaws in the church, um, you know, and laughing about it, you know, and joking about it. It's not something to laugh or joke about because these are people that we love and care for who are wandering away from the things that brought them to Adventism in the first place. And so it's extremely important that we understand these things. So anyway, let's close with prayer and then we're going to take a little bit longer break. Um, well, maybe not. We'll take a, we'll take a seven-minute break, and then uh, and then Brent will do the, his last message. Okay, let's kneel with, for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the light that you shed upon our path, for the truths that you have revealed to us through our lives. We're thankful, Lord, that we can see Jesus who loves us and cares for us and uh, who is a real uh, God, who is not uh, an imaginary God, something that we just work up some wishful thinking, but it's based on objective truths, upon prophecy, and upon your word. We know, Lord, that we each of us struggle in our day-to-day -day lives with so many things. And it's also easy sometimes, Lord, to, to be asleep and not to, to think about these things that, uh, that we once loved, but now we, uh, we just take for granted. And that they slowly slip away from us. We ask, Lord, that our faith in you can be renewed, that we can be strengthened, uh, and that we can strengthen one another. Help us, Lord, to deal with each man gently. Um, we ask that you can deal with us honestly and brutally in showing us our need of you. Be with each one now here and just help us to be awake in the next hour to, uh, to hear your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name.